Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk, View 3, Pina, and TypeScript, Trifecta for Effective State Management in Vue. Um, my name is Will Marple. I'm a principal engineer at Black Airplane. We are a full stack web and mobile application uh, development agency at, in, out of Woodstock, Georgia. We're just about 45 minutes north of, of here. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to discuss. Um, this talk is really about a high level, like architectural mental model and mindset that I have and carry into a lot of the front end web applications that I build. So this is not a low level, like implementation detail architecture talk. Um, so just kind of laying that out there to begin with. Um, we're gonna run through three. Oh, I already lost my audio somehow. I think I might have run out of batteries. No lights. All right, cool. Well, <clears throat> all right, cool, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna run through three segments. Uh, the first one's gonna be composition API and composable functions. And like how many regular view users do I have in here? Okay. How many died in the wool, I'll die writing option API people do I have in here? How many people do I have that regularly use and love composition API? Okay, cool. It's a few on the fence, so it'll still be, it'll still be useful. Um, we're, we'll go over Pina uh, as a global state manager, uh, and then we will talk a little bit about why using TypeScript with Vue and go over a little primer um, on how to start typing out your Pina stores. Because um, <clears throat> once you've aggregated all your state into a Pina store, um, it's low hanging fruit for type safety. All right, so the 10,000 foot view. Like this is the just rough mental model that you know I'm putting against a lot of things that I'm building. So. I'm a full stack dev, so it's a similar model in front or back end. In back end, I might have some sort of like durable storage, data layer, you know, rel relational database, et cetera, you know, business logic on top of that. And then if, if it's server rendered, maybe there's a presentational layer. If it's not, perhaps there's, there's an API of some sort that a, a one or more front ends are going to consume, right? Similarly, in the front end, you know, I, I think about the state in my global state kind of as that data layer, right? It, it's not as durable as something like a relational database, but it's still most, in, in many cases, a lot of your front end application is going to rely upon the data that's living inside of this, these global state modules. Um, similarly, on top of that, I'm gonna build out business logic and reusable logic um, that relies on the data and propagate it throughout the app. And then at the presentational layer, I'm going to build a lot of my single file components um, as stateless as I can. Um, and the main paradigm or the main reason for my opinion on that issue is that I don't believe that it's a good idea to have the concern of data flows in your application impose the architecture of how you choose to click those components together hierarchically or horizontally as siblings, right? Because what are the different um, data flow methodologies that we have available to us in Vue? We can, we can pass via props, we can prop drill, which I'm sure a lot of you know is probably not the best idea. Um, <clears throat> we have provide and inject, um, which can provide down through any depth of a single tree, but think about provide and inject for a moment. Um, you know, React has providers and you know, like a lot, this is not a view only concept. What would you do if you now have another sibling tree? You have one component tree, it has all the context it needs, right? But now you have another sibling tree next to it and it also needs the same context. What is your only play? To wrap it in another component so that you can provide it down to both trees, right? And so that's where global state comes into, into the mix, really, and frees up, introduces more flexibility to, your, to how you're structuring your components um, than these other methods. So starting out, how I will organize a project is, this is just kind of like a little tip moment, um, is I will write all of my API calls in 
plain old vanilla JS or, or TS files. And the reason for that is it, it's, it's oftentimes rare um, that I would be outside of the context of a component or composable function when I need to call out to the API, but those occasions do occur. And when we start out our code organization in these plain TS files in this case, um, I can call the raw, you know, make those raw calls from anywhere in my application regardless of the context that I am in. Um, <clears throat> so the next step building on top of that for me, a couple of options. Um, Pena, Global State Management has actions and these are a great candidate for async calls. Um, so you can start organizing those calls and the primary responsibility of these would be to prepare the payload for the call if necessary and also to prepare the response data structure if necessary and then place that into the global store. Um, <clears throat> a little tip, you can, uh, you know, as, as you might imagine as an, as an application scales, these can start to get kind of bloated um, with lots and lots of actions. So to combat that, you can start to break up your actions as you see here and then spread them out inside the, door, the store definition for better code organization. Another option uh, is, it's pun intended, um, another option is composable functions. Um, so similar responsibility here, prepping payload if necessary, prepping data structure if necessary, placing into the global store. Um, for anybody here who's not familiar with composable functions, you can, they're kind of like an upgrade to mix-ins with the option API. Um, and for anybody who's familiar with React, um, they're functionally pretty similar to React custom hooks. Um, but you'll see uh, with Composition API, we have a lot of organizational freedom to how we structure or, or organize the code within our components. Um, it's a very similar syntax and space um, with a composable function. Um, so <clears throat> before we move on, I just wanted to present the idea and really just my opinion. Um, that these opinions are my own. That there are definitely other great ways to architect apps. There are other great opinions out there. This is just Will's opinion and how I approach this. But my opinion on the matter is, um, I think consistency is really important. And so I will use globe, this, this approach, including global state, a lot earlier than you will see a lot of other people use it. Um, because I think if your app is a stateful app and has any significant amount of state that needs managed, um, it's not always easy to predict whether or not a small app will grow into a larger app or a medium-sized app will grow into a larger app. And so not only does it promote good habits, consistency in the way that you're architecting, but it also sets you up well with a flexible architecture that even if it may feel like a little overkill at a current phase of your app, um, sets you up well for the future if you ever need to grow it. So again, consistency above all in, in my opinion because we, we want to do our, sell, our future selves a solid and we wanna do any future devs that come behind us a solid and being consistent is, is a really great way um, to go about that. Um, <clears throat> so, for anybody who's died in the wool, Options API. Isn't Options API something that makes view view? Why would I switch to something more React esque? You know, we feel like we're losing some of our, our view identity a little bit. But I think on the subject of code organization and scalability, this is something with custom hooks that, that React got right. And I think that Composition API really is a genuine uh, advancement in, in the framework. Um, <clears throat> so some cool things that you can do with Composition API. Uh, reactivity outside of components. So it's something that I, I don't do a whole lot, but it definitely is a cool feature that I could see for certain implementations that might need to deal with multiple frameworks or you know um, libraries outside the the purview of of or context of a view component um, that you could have a view uh, app that was watching or leveraging reactivity from the framework as well as something outside of the view app that is also reacting to the same state um, with Composition API, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can see an example of that there on the left. So we just have a vanilla TS file there. 
we're pulling in elements of the composition API uh, to create a reactive object, um, and that's watchable by vanilla TS or, or JS code, as well as inside of a component. Uh, better code organization. So obviously, option API organizes all of our component code by its functional purpose. It doesn't organize it by its logical purpose. So if you do have a need for a component that has a lot of, it, like it's gonna grow into a larger component that may have multiple logical concerns going on inside of there, it can get a little bit arduous to scroll through and understand and reason about that component um, organized in the option API syntax. So here's, here's a couple of, of examples of just taking a simple option API component and refactoring it to a composition API component. Um, organized the same way, but the, the purpose here is it's not a difficult thing to get that refactor done and have it be organized the same way that it was in option API. Um, but you, as you can see here, you're now free to shift those different elements around as you see fit and organize them as you see fit. Um, so this kind of promotes reusability and composition um, just inherently. Uh, and another thing to note compared to mix-ins and option API is that there was this annoyance really of, of naming collisions inherent with mix-ins that um, composable functions resolve. Uh, so here is another example of an, a mix-in versus, uh, or just really a mix-in being leveraged here uh, in a component uh, and what that would look like syntactically. Obviously, um, a lot of us who have been around the Vue ecosystem for a while are familiar with that um, equivalent thing with composition API and a composable function. Um, and just to put a little bit of, of um, definition behind what I'm talking about when I say composition API versus composable function. Composition API is what you're looking at on the right. Um, and a composable function is what you're looking at on the left. Um, the use keyword is not required, but it is common convention um, among the view community. Um, and then syntactically, one of the things that makes, in my opinion, composable functions awesome is that similar to mixins and option API being, being the same syntactically, composable functions are as well. So inside that execution context, inside the function, uh, syntactically you're doing all the same things that you would be doing if you were in a component itself. Um, so you do get some enhanced TypeScript support when you're using composition API. Um, great strides have been made. Uh, you do have pretty solid TypeScript support in Option API, um, but it is going to be a little bit better um, when you're using Composition API. So one example is, is here on the left, if you see the, the data object there on the left, where we have to kind of tell TypeScript, like we're strongly telling you right here <laughs> that this thing is a number so that we can get that inference that we want. Um, with Composition API, that sort of thing is not as necessary. Um, improved reactivity system. So <clears throat> you get a lot more fine-grained control with ref and reactive um, than you do by just exporting it or you know, leveraging a data object in the option API, uh, which can, in some cases, streamline uh, the debugging process, at least in my experience. Um, one example of that <clears throat> is here. So you'll notice for, for fairness, I, I placed the watch portion of the option object directly below the data portion uh, in the option API example. Um, however, in practical application, when and this is, again, just, I guess, my organizational preference, what I, how I would usually structure an option API approach would be data first, followed by computeds, followed by all my methods, followed by lifecycle hooks and watchers. Um, you all may have had a different way of, of organizing those, but the main point is, as a component grows, you know, if, if I were organizing my, my option API code in that way, watchers are way down below all my methods, 
And so perhaps I create a watcher while I'm debugging to watch some piece of reactive state because I really want to drill in and see what the heck's going on when this re reactivity happens or if it's happening. Um, it can be become kind of arduous to you know, scroll back and forth or collapse the intermediary code so I can look at both of those things at the same time and reason about them. Whereas with Composition API, we're free now to just place a watcher right below that piece of reactive state, which makes it really obvious too when we're doing cleanup after we've completed our debugging tasks and things that we were just, we're all, all we're doing in here is console logging this thing. We can blow it away now that we've figured it out, right? Um, so embracing Composition API is not about abandoning what we know, um, but about evolving with Vue to craft more scalable, maintainable, and modular apps. Um, so in the end, uh, Composition API may take a little bit of time to get used to if you're not used to it. Um, and it's a little different from Option API, but all of the features that we know and love from Option API are present. You know, defining props, defining emits, watchers, you know, lifecycle hooks, all that stuff. A lot of it's just macros, you know, that you pull in syntactically a little different, but all those features are there with the added benefit of that code organization. Um, so this is kind of addressing what I was talking about a little bit earlier, that in my opinion, I will pull in global state a little bit earlier um, than a lot of people would pull it in because I think a lot of the arguments that used to be a thing um, that I would hear aren't really super valid anymore. Like it's introducing bloat into your into your code base. Um, if your code base is 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 slow and you're using global state, it's not because of the library. Um, I it's because you probably have deeply nested large data structures that are reactive throughout that are causing performance problems. Um, so in my opinion, global state's not just for large apps. You know, you hear that statement made a lot that, you know, oh, well, when my app gets to this level or this scale, you know, then we pull in global state because now we need it. You know, it goes back to my earlier point. Like, I think if you have a stateful application that has any significant amount of state, global state is useful. And that's how I approach uh, front ends. Uh, consistency and strong habits uh, being the last two points there. Um, <clears throat> so let's go over a little bit of how, I mean, how many Pina users do we have in here? Man, got a lot of strong view people in here, like power to the view people. Um, so <laughs> for you guys, this may be a little bit, I, I created this to kind of be a primer for people that may not be using Pina yet. So um, if you already know some of this, uh, you know, forgive me and bear with me here. But um, store definition, um, very simple. Unique ID is a string first argument, and you have an object that is the actual uh, definition of the store um, containing state getters and actions. Um, consumption, very, very cool. Um, very standard, something you're probably used to with, with any global state management library you've ever used. But this is the real beauty of Pina. Like, who has used Vuex? <sighs> who hates writing explicit mutation functions? Who loves that Pina doesn't make you do that anymore? <laughs> right? So, like, this is the, the let's celebrate for a moment. Okay. So, syntactically direct mutation, but maintaining immutability under the hood, super powerful. Um, batch updating with uh, the patch feature of Pina, also pretty cool. Um, getters, pretty straightforward here. We've got a, you know, username getter. Uh, com or computed uh, on the store that we're wrapping in another computer to create a larger computed value here. This is syntactically how you use it, just like a property. There is caching involved. Um, let's see, actions also pretty straightforward. We're calling them as though they're just a property on an object that's containing a function value here, um, receiving any number of arguments. So. Let's talk about stepping it up to the next level. Who here does TypeScript with Vue often? Okay, cool. So this next part um, is just going to be a bit of a primer and we're gonna focus on just some entry level, how, how can we type a, a Vue store? Because one of the benefits of aggregating all of your state 
into a global store is that now it becomes a big piece of low-hanging fruit to introduce type safety with TypeScript all in one place. Um, so the why, like in our, in the larger front-end community, um, you know, if any of y'all listen to a lot of the influencer voices out there, there are a lot of different opinions about TypeScript, whether we should use it, whether it's worthwhile. Like I've, I've heard prominent people say that I feel like I'm wasting my time when I'm using TypeScript and I'm just grinding away at these weird problems, right? And, or, and I hear other people say, why not just use JS doc instead of TypeScript? So um, this segment kind of aims toward you know, the why of TypeScript, in my opinion. Um, and one of them is if, if you do development as a career and it's how you earn a living, it could be great for your career because I think TypeScript has a great backing um, and it is one of the most advanced type safety systems out there right now. And so from a value in the marketplace perspective, it's a good choice for you. Um, I think enhanced developer experience and relying on your IDE, this is a big one. Like I've had the privilege of, of being involved in the apprenticeship program at Black Airplane and help teach people and that sort of thing. And I'm teaching someone, um, one of my big opinions and things that I drill is relying on your IDE a lot because some people you'll, that I don't know why, um, but they have, they feel like I'm, I'm not doing this right unless I'm physically typing this whole thing out when they're first learning, right? And so I have to kind of corral them in and say like, no, listen, like we're all human. We should be relying on our IDE. Like I don't feel comfortable if my IDE a lot of times has not kind of shown me and confirmed my suspicions of like these properties are available, these methods are available, this is the correct name for this thing that you're using, right? Like I want to start typing it and I want my IDE or my tools to finish my sentence because it gives me that confidence. Um, and so I think TypeScript and from a developer experience perspective is a big win uh, in this regard because if you're, you're building a, an application in JavaScript that has complicated data structures, uh, it's really gonna come in clutch both for yourself down the line after you've implemented something and other people on your team, just having that confidence of, in the IDE of, of getting that autocomplete and getting corrected when we're misusing something, right? Um, so clear contracts, uh, they help new team members understand architecture and data flows uh, and prevent regression or backsliding in the code base uh, when making changes. Um, so skill transferability, this could be another reason why TypeScript might be attractive to you if you're not using it already. Um, so there are a lot of strongly typed languages out there and you know, maybe one day you do want to transition to a job that, you know, specializes in C Sharp or Java or Rust or, you know, one of these other languages. Or maybe at your current workplace, you guys want to start writing in a language that's strongly typed. You could be the developer that helps lead that charge because you're familiar with the paradigms that come along with uh, strongly typed languages. Um, so... I already mentioned the, the thought on this slide, but we've kind of aggregated all of our state together. That's been kind of the game plan all along so that we can target it uh, with TypeScript. So let's start out with, uh, you know, kind of when I was learning TypeScript, kind of something that was a little confusing to me because I people that knew more about it than me were kind of like interchangeably using type and interface. And I was like, okay, well, when you use type and when you use interface, like make a decision, <laughs> you know? And so, so these, are, these are just some guardrails or some, some guidelines. So um, types can represent both primitive union and intersection types. They're more flexible in some scenarios and ideal for creating complex types using unions or intersections as a general, um, kind of like a general high level rule. Like let's imagine we're building an application that has clearly defined data models. Like you might have a user model, or if you're building e-commerce, you have a product data model, or an event data model. If you're building an event management system, whatever it is, right, you'll have data models. Types are great for your data models, and you can kind of define those relationships, right? And then I think about interfaces more as larger data structures, so the defining kind of like the shape of a larger data structure. So in the context of Pina, generally what that looks like 
is I will have types for my various data models that will be contained within the store, and then I'll have an interface that just defines, or one or more interfaces that will define the larger shape uh, of that store module itself. Um, <clears throat> by using inter, uh, user state interface in the state function return type, we're ensuring that initial state matches the shape we've defined here in this example. Um, the getters and actions work with the state. Um, user, we use the user state to type the state parameter here. Uh, you see down in the bottom. Um, so this is just a little example of syntactically what a simple or the beginnings of, I guess I would say, the beginnings of a store definition might look like. And you could grow this from this point. Um, <clears throat> so defining initial state. Why might you need an initial state? Well, the most common reason would be if you want to kind of reset your state back to all of its default values without having to do a full page reload, um, you might want to maintain all of those default values uh, for that reason. So this is just a little example of what it might look like to define an initial state and have that type definition on the initial state. Um, so finally, kind of reaping the benefits here. Um, on the left, we've got an example of a getter, active users. Um, we're just checking to filter out all of the users that actually have a valid email for us, or a truthy email, at the very least. Um, and then we're consuming that inside of a component. And because our store is typed, we now have auto-completion -complete on a number of things. Um, the return type of this getter uh, and properties are all inferred by TypeScript and would be auto-completed. Um, and also up there in the top in the template, because we have typed out the user, uh, the user model, we're going to get all of the properties on the user when we're util utilizing it in the template. All right. Typing actions. The only thing that, because virtually all actions are going to be void functions and not return anything, we're going to type the uh, arguments or the, pro the parameters that we're defining in the action definition itself. Uh, and that is going to be about all we need to do with actions. Let's talk a little bit about utilities. Um, so I'm just going to run through, there are, there are a number of different utilities available with TypeScript, but I'm just going to run through a few of the common ones that I run into, I think most often, it's kind of taking them off the top of my head here, and um, anyway, dive into these. So the partial utility. Um, partial is going to take a, a larger type, and it is going to, to tell TypeScript, hey, listen, I'm expecting this thing that has all these properties, but it's just going to be part of this thing. It's not going to be all of this thing, so calm down, right? So an example of this would be, like, let's say we have this function update user details, and we have all of these um, required properties that are part of a user detail or a user, right, user type. Um, but in practical application, maybe we're just doing partial updates. You know, we're not always going to be giving every property of, ev of the user uh, every single time, right? This is not going to work. What you're seeing here, down here in the, in the lower screen, is, is not going to work. And so partial kind of comes, comes to the rescue in these kinds of situations um, where you no longer will be required to, to pass in every single property every time. Um, it, it's also important to note that you're, you are also not able to be confident that every property is going to be there all the time. So you are going to have to account for that um, as you consume that argument in the function. Uh, the pick utility, so um, does pretty much what its, what its name implies. Uh, the first argument's gonna be the interface or, or type that you're picking things out of. Uh, and then the, like logically, the result is gonna be what's in the comment below. Um, so we're basically just creating a new type of sorts um, uh, that's a subset of a greater type or a larger type. Similarly, omit um, is going to do the opposite, right? Um, and it's gonna create a type that is everything except what you've told it uh, is going to be present. Um, 
And then finally, combining them. So I think one of the reasons why TypeScript is hailed as, as being one of the you know, most advanced uh, type safety systems out there uh, today is it offers a lot of um, flexibility and precision in terms of defining exactly what kind of types that you're going to require. So here in this example, we've, we've decided there are gonna be some mandatory fields, name and email on the user type, right? Um, but in addition to that, we've said, okay, well, we're also gonna, it's gonna be, a, could potentially be a partial on this type as well, but we're omitting out that name and email because we've already declared it. We wanna maintain that, uh, those mandatory fields that we declared um, in advance. So just kind of a, an example of combining utilities with TypeScript. The last one was the record view utility um, for type mapping. So. In this scenario, we're imagining we have like roles and permissions kind of situation, and we want to type that out and say, you know, the, the, whatever this thing is going to be, it's going to be, the, the property is going to be one of these roles, and the value is going to be any number of these permissions, right? Um, and so this is an example of what something like that might be or might look like, and uh, how you might define it uh, in the context of defining a Pina store. You can see in the state, we have role permissions there, uh, and we've got properties of roles, values of any number of the permissions. All right, uh, finally, let's get to typing out some of the first class citizens within the view framework. We'll finish up with some computeds and ref reactive, that sort of thing. Um, so this is gonna be, so how many people are using script setup tags? And how many people love the setup function? Okay, man, you guys are all like very much on the same page. <laughs> I love this. We should have just had like a round table in this talk. <laughs> Telling you guys all things you already know. Um, okay, anyway. <laughs> Uh, so computed, you can see you're, you're just defining the return type. Uh, this is just syntactically how you you tell um, the type checker, like, hey, this computed returns a string, right? Um, cool. So ref and reactive. Um, ref is, for anybody that in here that doesn't know, um, generally speaking, you can think of ref as kind of being for primitives, like, you know, numbers or strings, you know, things like that. Um, and then reactive is gonna be for a reactive object. Um, and so this is how you would type both of those different um, reactive data types. You can see at the top we have a count there, ref of zero, you know it's always gonna be a number. Um, and then we have a reactive object with a type defined there that we're, we're typing out at the end of those script setup tags. Um, Okay, cool. Typing props with defaults. So because of the, the vertical limitations, I didn't actually include the props in define props because, and that's probably a good thing given the context of how every, familiar everyone is here with Vue, but um, people typing props with with defaults often in here? Yeah, familiar with with defaults? Okay, cool. Um, so this is just the syntax that you use if you're in a situation where you were like, oh man, I'm, you know, I'm gonna need a bunch of props, maybe I'm on the, the, the leaves of my tree. That's a, a point I wanted to make during this talk that in this overarching architecture that I've described, um, I'm not saying that passing props is a bad thing all the time. I mean, I think there's a time and place for passing props, right? I think there's a time and place for, for provide and inject. I'm not demonizing those things in any way, shape, or form. I, I did want to express, though, that in my approach, um, oftentimes if I, I find that if I am passing props, uh, it is more toward the leaves of my tree. So it's gonna be, when I say leaves, I mean the buck stops here. I'm not stacking on hierarchically a lot more beyond this component that I own. So a lot of times that's gonna be something like an input field or a button or some sort of like chart component you're making or like that sort of thing. Like those are the types of components I find um, it, it starts to make more sense to pass some props there 
to have some localized state in those components, to emit some events back to the consumers on those components, right? Um, so anyway, props with defaults, you would handle that props object just the same way that you're familiar with, validation, the whole thing. Um, and okay, so I went way faster than I thought I was gonna go. Um, that's the end of my slides. Now, we could go a couple of different routes because I know I got another 15 minutes or so at least um, that I could talk about different things. I have a couple of different thing, directions we could go. One is I have a repo on TensorFlow.js, Vue 3, and Pina that we can discover together. Um, the other one is I have a repo that just kind of demonstrates everything, or at least Vue 3, Composition API, and Pina that we could kind of go over. Given the reading the room of how familiar you guys are with Vue already, I think we should probably demo the TensorFlow thing. Does anybody want to see the TensorFlow thing? Yeah, cool, TensorFlow, cool. Uh, all right, let's do TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. okay, cool. So this is a project that's written with U3, Pina, Vite is my build tool. Got a couple of different models going on in here. One is, let's see, let's, let's close that stuff. Let's allow this, it's gonna turn my phone on like it always does. For some reason, Ventura like is super bossy about taking over my phone instead of using the webcam like I want it to. All right, cool. So this is a little demo app I made, um, TFJS talk, and the paradigm behind this is um, just a little like social media feed, right? So thinking about, you know, TensorFlow has the capability of loading a model, performing inference in the browser, um, which is, I think is very cool that's happening on the client side, um, and thinking about like, what could I do with that? You know, we've been interacting with social media feeds for a long time that are probably using AI to figure out like what we're interested in and finding our feeds and that sort of thing, right? So I wrote a little social media app that looks at my face. Uh, it can tell my, my expression, whether I'm surprised, happy, angry, that sort of thing. I find that with my beard, it thinks I'm angry or sad a lot of the time, um, <laughs> but also uh, doing uh, image classification as well. So the paradigm here is I know how long you looked at the image. I know what was in the image. I know how you felt when you looked at the image. And so I can start advertising to you about things that you like, right? Um, so you can see found a traffic light, happy about the traffic light, uh, found some sheep. Um, the way this is working in the back end is I'm reaching out to the Pexels uh, image API. Um, this is using the Coco SSD uh, image classification model. Um, it has a, a set of like 90 different types of objects that it can classify within images. And so I married this up for this proof of concept app um, because Pexels has the ability to pass a query parameter when you, when you request images. So um, I wanted a feed that was largely full of images that contained objects that Coco SSD uh, would be able to recognize. Um, if you were wanting to use this for a production application, uh, it's important to note that um, TensorFlow has this ability to do this thing called transfer learning. So you can take your own data set and you can refine the capabilities of any of these models that Google has pre-trained and put on TensorFlow Hub. Um, so it's pretty cool, and you can do all of it in the browser, uh, with that, and it's a lot less computationally heavy uh, and time intensive than training a model from the ground up. 
And you see it does a pretty good job for the, for the different images that, it's, um, that it says that it can, can classify. So anyway, you guys see what it does. That's cool. Let's look over the code real quick. Um, and this is a public repo, so like any, anybody that wants to play around with this, um, I'll, I'll give you the link to the repo. I designed it uh, specifically for a couple of reasons. Um, the first was for anybody who wanted to learn Composition API to introduce some low-hanging fruit for them to start um, refactoring this app uh, using Composition API and Composable Functions. I've written a lot of logic into Composable Functions here, um, but as you can see, I have one really big component <laughs> that I made for feed.view, right? So the big low-hanging fruit here would be to start to, to, to extract out maybe a post component um, and use the, the re reusable functionality in the composable functions within that post component, right? Um, but <clears throat> anyway, uh, the way that I'm figuring out dwell time is with a good old intersection observer. Um, so that's generally the first part that I will show. Um, and it's pretty simple. Um, Everybody here familiar with intersection observers? Use them? Yeah, like them? Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, we are we have this handler for when the event happens. We're figuring out, you know, is it entering? Is it exiting? And then we have actions on the on the Pina store that that handle um, the dwell time. Just the, it's not updating real time because I in my head I'm like, if I were doing this. For real, like obviously I wouldn't have the overlays, you wouldn't be seeing yourself in a camera feed, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? And I would just be diffing the time, like I would be, when you start looking at it, when you finish looking at it, and I know how long you've looked at it. So that's, that's what this is doing, right? Um, the next thing, Coco SSD and the image classification. Um, the, main, the main point to get across here was really that I was surprised at how simple it was to get something that to get something done. Like I built this little thing in like an hour, right? And um, it was shockingly shockingly simple from the from the AI side of things. Like you literally are just pulling in Coco SSD as a dependency, right? This is how you load it here, and then. It returns a promise when that's done, you get the model that's ready to receive input. We're calling the code that, that it's actually gonna do the work. It has access to the model here and the argument. And then once we have an image to run, this, this featured image to run detections on, we feed it, it gets a promise, and then the re return of that resolution is gonna be all the prediction, predictions that figured out, right? And then we're putting those on into the global state. So if we were to come over here and look into the global state. For whatever reason, like I love Pina Dev Tools, but like in Brave Browser at least, it doesn't seem to want to load first. Pina does not seem to want to load first try. All right, here we go. Cool. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I want to actually find some things and do some emotions before I. Okay, cool. Um, sweet. All right, so now if we go into our global state here and we start looking at some of the data in the state, you can see emotions that have been returned, predictions that have been returned, found a donut, found a microwave, cool. So that's what that code is doing, placing it into the, placing it into the Pina store there. Uh, and then finally, oh, this last, Composable function for face API is what is handling the expression detection. There we go. So it's a very similar, um, very similar process to just loading a TensorFlow model directly. It's important to note that this is actually a, it is actually a package, a larger package that's relying on on TensorFlow core. Um, it can do. The, the face detector is gonna do recognition. So you'd use that for like, oh, I see, I see Will is in this picture, this picture, and this picture, but not these other pictures, right? Um, the expression, which I just demonstrated, uh, it, can, it can also do age and, and gender recognition uh, as well, all in one package. So I left some of that out just, you know, if somebody wants to come in here and tinker, that's some low-hanging fruit, but 
thing, a thing you could do to expand the functionality of uh, this little demo to add some age and gender recognition. But anyway, this is the thing that grabs onto the uh, video feed from my webcam. And once that's ready, it starts the emotion tracking. This is what's doing the emotion tracking. Um, we are right here handling the detections. Um, and this is what actually brings in the expressions. Like you have to give it the face detector initially and then you can just chain on the these, these additional capabilities, which I thought was pretty slick. But um, this is where we're handling the, the detections. Um, it's gonna give you all of the emotions every single time with a confidence uh, value represented as a float. Um, in this example, I'm just using the highest confidence value uh, and placing it into the global state right here on line 54. So that is it for the TFJS portion. Any, any questions on this, this little app? I can't tell if you're squinting at the screen or you're concerned or you just have questions, but you, I feel your energy has questions. <laughs> oh, cool. All right, guys. Well, that is genuinely what I've got for you today. Um, I apologize. We went about nine minutes short. Uh, if you have any questions for me, feel free to ask. Um, but beyond that, uh, I will put my LinkedIn and Twitter back up. Please uh, reach out. Love to connect with people. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Yes. So, um we have a pretty like large scale view app that's sure. falling into the options API. What do you think it would be worth the effort to go through and update all the components in Optician? Because that um, would take a bit of effort since it's got a lot of large things. Because it looks like it's got a lot of cool stuff with the organization that you're talking about. It really does. So I like a couple of things I didn't mention. And I'm going to directly answer this question too, but you just jogged my memory on another thing I wanted to say, which was because TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, in some cases you can advocate and, intro and introduce it into a code base that doesn't have it yet. You know, it doesn't add to the bundle size. It's really only for development time and build time, right? Um, and then especially if you have devs on the team that are familiar with TypeScript and devs that aren't, it's a great way of doing knowledge transfer if it's okay uh, within the context of the app of doing it because the, the non-TS devs are gonna see real implementations of TS code, they're gonna start following suit and have access to those devs. So anyway, um, that's a cool onboarding with uh, just tip with TS that may not have occurred to you. Anyway, Refactoring from Options API. Yeah, my opinion, yes. Like I think you could make an argument for both cases. Really depends on your app. But my opinion, if I were in that position, yes, I would. And the way I would approach it is I would get everybody on the same page and experienced with. We, we, I would do like a break in time. Like we're writing Composition API now, right? Get everybody comfortable with the paradigm of using Composition API. And then once they are there, then say, okay, now every time you have to go back into a component and update it, maintain it, work on it, or whatever, this is how we refactor that component, right? And you can take a couple of different approaches. One is you can add a setup method into the options object, and you, you can progressively refactor into that setup method, right? And then once that component reaches full composition API, you can copy it out, blow that away, create a script setup tag, and paste it all in, literally. Right, so that could be an upgrade path for you. Um, the only thing that has caught, tripped me up, and this could just be a me thing, is gosh, the return object on the setup function has bitten me so many times. Like, I, and it's usually when I'm tired at the end of the day and it's late and I'm not, I'm just like, phew, why are you doing this? It's not working right, you know? And I was like, I've done this a million times and I'm like, option object, or the return, the reactive return object, you know, like, ah. You know, so that's just kind of a caveat that's been a thing for me that, you know, I, and why I love script setup tags because you don't have to worry about that. And it's just magical land that you can just, call a weight inside of it, and then surround it by a suspense boundary. Also, suspense is super cool. Everybody loves suspense. Okay. Anybody not know about suspense? Should I, should I talk about suspense? Okay. 
So suspense um, is a cool feature of Vue where there's no more is loading true or false with suspense, right? So you can wrap any, any, any level of depth of component tree in a suspense tag and it will, wait, it will wait for every single async setup in that entire tree to finish before it shows the actual rendered version of your front end. So you'll have a fallback that will be your loading state. You'll have the default area that will be your actual rendered app. And Suspense will just automatically await every single async setup inside the entire tree. And so, I, I mean, I'm, that's pretty impressive to me. And, it, you know, not, it's definitely better than having to worry about throwing is loadings everywhere. <laughs> so. Async, async setup, how do, you, how do you do that? Oh, okay. Let's, let's talk about that. Async setup. Without the setup attribute, it's just, you know, async setup on the options. No, no, no. So, yeah, yeah. So you can do it one of two ways, right? So way one is you call async, like let's say we had a, let's, let's just do one right here, right? Let's see, options, example. Hmm. No, I don't want to track it good. Okay, so that's cool. You just call a wait. All you do is call a wait. So really, uh, if, if you were like this in script setup, you just call await my thing. And it, now, it's, now it's async setup. Yeah, so any script setup tag that is, that is doing like const response equals await, await to my thing, right? Or anything that is doing uh, this, we're exporting default object, and we have a async setup function, right, and we're doing this kind of thing, um, then we can await my thing. So any of, either of those two things going on, like in the entire tree, it's going to wait for every single one of them in the whole tree. Yeah, that's why it's this magical land where you don't have to return anything and does TypeScript really well, and you can just await things. <laughs> so, anyway, cool. One other thing you said, um, Pena maintains what you said. immutability. Yeah, immutability without having mutation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not an expert. Like, I've, it's not like I've gone through and read the Pena code. You know, I've listened to some keynotes by the creator uh, himself, but. Um, Suffice it to say, like the flux pattern is the pattern that is used most often um, in things like Redux to and, and Immer and you know things that you might be familiar with to like maintain immutability while allowing updates to state uh, reliable updates to state. So Pina is like syntactically giving you that like irresponsible direct mutation kind of convenience, but. It's also in the back end, like doing the same thing as a Redux or a Vuex or something like that would be doing. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do I mean? Like it's it's so okay. Um, so when you call the property on the object, right, and you set it equal to a brand new value, you are not actually updating. Similarly to like okay. Ref, right? How do you get the value off of a ref? Right, you get the value property off of it, right? So under the hood, it's doing the same thing. So when you update that property, you're not updating the uh, you're not updating the underlying value. You're triggering reactivity within within Pina, and Pina is going, oh, they want to update this thing. What do they want to update it with? And then it's going to the actual value and updating it for you. You're not directly accessing that underlying value when you're doing that. Similarly, when you want it, when you call it and you say, hey, go get me that thing, right, off the store. You're not like getting that actual value. Pina is going, oh, I need to react to this. They, they want this thing, like go reach into the thing and then go get, give it to them. Uh, I okay. Yeah, I, I was wondering like what protections you know, that it was providing for. So, and, and so you're not overriding, you're, it has to wait, right? So, and that, what it's trying to accomplish and what it does accomplish, I'm assuming, 
is things like race conditions. So like you imagine you have this global state that's accessible throughout this large tree of, of apps that could all be reaching out to it at any various period of time. You need a gatekeeper that's gonna make sure that there aren't gonna be side effects or race conditions, right, with that thing. Okay. Good questions. Anything else? Ooh, I think we're getting close to, yeah, we're at 4.55. Cool. Thank you, guys.